This morning, we are going to be reading from Romans chapter 8. We're starting at verse 1 and going through to, uh, well, until there's no more words on the screen. (laughs) The print in my Bible is really small, so I might be reading from up there. So read it. Let's read it together. Romans chapter 8. There is therefore no, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that week through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemns sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, or indeed can be. So then, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, we who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your immortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The end. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Would you help us uh, to focus our thoughts this morning on you and your word? Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has made us free from the law of sin and death. May the truth that we are no longer subject to the dictates of our enemy encourage us. For you have set us free to serve a living and holy God. Thank you for the spirit of God who dwells in those whose hearts are turned towards you. May we never disappoint or grieve the Spirit, and so empower us by your grace. Father, we stand with you against the enemy who is causing turmoil and disasters within our jurisdictions. May we hold you, your standard, high and declare your truth to a world that desperately needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rebuke the enemy in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and build a hedge of protection around our church and our people, for we ask it in Jesus' name and through his blood. Amen. We're going to stand together in just a moment. We're going to sing a wonderful song, Rejoice. And I was thinking this week about the verse um, that talks about that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And that in some sense, the most agonizing, difficult death that has ever been experienced, where the wrath of Almighty God was poured upon him for our sins, was a joy to Christ. And it wasn't because there was any pleasure in it. It was agony. But it was because of what would be accomplished in the end. And we can look at our lives and our circumstances and know that even in the difficulties, even in the trials, there is joy because of what God is accomplishing in them. And so I'd encourage you to look at, the, at what you're going through in life and then, like Paul in Philippians, say, I can rejoice even in the sufferings. So let's stand together and let's sing. Rejoice. Rejoice. 
wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord.
all like the unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. My worth is not in what I hold, not in the strength of flesh and Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that our soul is satisfied in none other than you alone. And as we spend these next moments opening up your word, I pray that you would meet us here, Father. I pray that your spirit would work deeply inside of us. That we would understand the words of scripture, understand the food that you have for us today. And that like every Sunday we come in here, we would leave here a changed people ready to go out into the world and to be salt and light. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I would invite the four to five-year-olds. You can be dismissed and head towards your classroom. And for the rest of you, I would invite you to turn to the book of Colossians. We will be back in the first chapter of Colossians this morning. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you can open to Colossians 
chapter 1, and we will begin in verse 19. Colossians 1 and verse 19. It says, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present to you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister." This is the word of our Lord this morning. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. My hope and prayer this week is that you were all like Bereans as you left here last week and we went through that passage on the preeminence of Jesus Christ. That all of scripture points to the beauty and the majesty of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done in redemptive history. And so my hope this morning and all week was that it did not go in one ear and out the other, that that was something that you dwelled on all throughout the week. And so in verse 19, when Paul deals with or continues to deal with, it's almost like he just couldn't stop talking for a moment about the deity of Christ. He continues the thought in verse 19 when he says... That all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ. All the fullness of God. This takes us right back to the passage that we were in last week when it talked about Jesus Christ being the image of the invisible God. That he was the firstborn over all creation. That all things were created by him and that he sustains all things. And we concluded that he is the goal of all creation. That everything is about Jesus Christ. See, Paul, again, is finishing this thought here that Jesus Christ is Lord, but he is not quite done with it. The language here for the word fullness, as well as throughout all the letter of the Colossians, anytime that we get to fullness, we're going to see it again in chapter 2, as well as all the time that the idea here of, of fullness is seen in the Old Testament, is this idea of of God filling the temple with his presence. God filling the temple with his presence. An example of this in the Old Testament is in Ezekiel 44.4. It says, So I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. And the response was, And I fell on my face. See, fullness here means the totality of divine power and attributes of God, all that God is, are fully in Jesus Christ. This is something that we have a very difficult time wrapping our minds around, I believe. I heard it said one time, I think it was Stephen Lawson said, that trying to wrap our minds around the attributes of who God is is like trying to wrap our arms around the Atlantic Ocean. That our finite brains have an incredibly difficult time with understanding the totality of who God is. We cannot do that. We can begin to understand what is revealed to us in Scripture. But His ways are higher than our ways. And so it is difficult for us to grasp. And yet this is no excuse for us to stop there and say, Well, I know 
at least a little bit of what the Bible says about who God is, about the attributes of, of who he is in Scripture. And so, you know what, I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm comfortable with it being at that. No, our job as Christians is to strive to get to know God to a greater level, to understand him more fully. And we should never, ever, ever tire of that pursuit. And so with that in mind this morning, let's take a look just rather briefly at a couple passages that talk about who God is. In Psalm 95, verse 3 to 5, it says this. It says, For the Lord is the great God and the King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed dry land. As we read through that, just try and let your mind at least begin to grasp the greatness and the awesomeness of who God is. We have another passage in Isaiah 40 and verse 12, and it says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. You see, these verses at least start to give us an idea of the greatness, of the awesomeness, of the all-powerfulness of the God that we serve. And in Colossians, Paul makes it overwhelmingly clear That all of that greatness, all of who God is, dwells fully in Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this this week as I prepared last week and this week. And just this idea of the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Trying to get an understanding of, of who God is. And I came to the conclusion that, at least for me, but I imagine for you also, that one of the problems that I really have in my Christian walk... I think one of the things that maybe steals some of the the zeal away that I have for Christ is that my view of God is not big enough. My view of God is not big enough. That I read in Scripture who God is, I know what Christ has done for me, I know the Sunday school answers, and for some reason I am tempted to stop there. But we should never stop there. I was greatly convicted this week that my view, my understanding of who God is needs to be on a massive scale. That I should not be content with this just idea of God is as I know him. That I should drive myself into the scriptures so that the Holy Spirit of God can teach me to a greater extent the fullness and the majesty of who God is and how he dwells fully in his son, Jesus Christ. My kids and I are, are going through the Chronicles of Narnia series. You may be familiar with the series. It's by C.S. Lewis. If you have not gone through it, I would highly recommend it to you. It's an incredible, incredible series of novels. But right now we're in the book of Prince Caspian. It's, it's kind of midway through the series. And there's a scene in the Chronicles of Narnia that is incredibly powerful, and C.S. Lewis speaks to this. See, in the Chronicles of Narnia, you have four main characters. You have Peter, Edmund, Lucy, and Susan... And then you have a kingdom full of animals. And the greatest of all of these animals is a character named Aslan. And Aslan represents the Lord. He represents Jesus Christ. And it's amazing to see how these characters interact with Aslan and how C.S. Lewis is able to just masterfully weave the truths of Scripture through the narrative and the interaction of these characters. This one example in the book Prince Caspian, Lucy has not seen Aslan for a long, long time, and she is finally again confronted with him, and so she rushes to him. She meets him, and she says, Aslan, you're bigger. Her perception of him is is bigger. He seems bigger. He seems much larger than the last time she saw him. And Aslan responds by saying, that is because you are older. Lucy is a little bit curious of this, and he says, not because you are bigger. And Aslan says, I am not, child, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. That's amazing insight into what we're talking about here. Christian, does your 
understanding of who God is? Does your understanding of Jesus Christ grow as you mature in Christ? It ought to. Is your understanding of Jesus Christ the same that it was at this time last year? At this time last month? At this time last week? That certainly it's not a, a, a just positive linear correlation that we'll read and our understanding of Christ will be greater, but we should beg the Lord that He would give us a more full understanding of who Jesus Christ is because that has massive implications for our life. All the fullness of our huge, awesome, powerful God dwells in Jesus Christ. Paul moves on in his thought in this passage, and he moves to verse 20. And as we move to verse 20 and we look ahead to the rest of the passage, we will notice that one of the words that gets repeated again and then again in verse 22 is this idea of being reconciled. Reconciled. Reconciliation. It's a beautiful word. And it's repeated a number of times in this passage and throughout Scripture. Our attention must be on the passage at hand, but in verse 20 it specifically states that all things are reconciled to himself on earth and in heaven. On earth and in heaven. Now as we work our way through a passage of Scripture, as we are taking our Bible, as we are reading, we should always be wanting to ask questions of the text that we see. And what we see here in verse 20, it says that all things were reconciled to him, things on heaven and things in the earth. And so you would immediately ask the question, well, if all things are reconciled back to him, does that mean that everyone is going to be saved? Does that mean that everyone is going to be saved? Well, the answer lies in the meaning of the word reconcile, and so let's look at that for a brief moment, and then we'll come back and we'll answer our question here. You see, the Greek word reconcile in this passage means to change or to exchange. The usage in the New Testament often refers to a change in a sinner's relationship to God. That there is a a change that happens in the nature of that person in their relationship to God. And so let's come back to all things, or will all things be reconciled to God through Christ? Will everyone come into relationship with Christ? Well, certainly not. Right? We understand this. The rest of the New Testament teaches this, and we always must interpret Scripture with Scripture, that a certain part of Scripture can never contradict another part of Scripture. But we understand that certainly not everyone will be reconciled back to God. That there are people that will reject him. And so really, what is actually being talked about here? What does it mean that all things will be reconciled back to God? Well, first we can actually say that when it references things in heaven and things on the earth, we can actually suggest here that creation will be reconciled back to God. In Genesis 3, we understand that creation suffered because of the curse and the fall. But in Romans 8, if you were to keep reading beyond the passage that you read this morning, we would read that for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And that the creation actually is groaning together in the pains of childbirth. That creation itself is just yearning for the day when Christ will return and everything will be reconciled back to him. Creation will be brought back to its primal obedience. It will be like it was before the fall. But in terms of human beings, let's finally answer our question here. There is a difference here between submitting to the lordship of Christ and being reconciled to Christ. Let's tease out those, that difference here because it's, it's very important. There's a difference between submitting to the lordship of Christ and being reconciled to Christ. See, all, or one day everyone, whether they like it or not, will submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Human beings, we talked last week about angels. There's, there's more talk of angels coming up that the false teachers in Colossae were really trying to lure the Colossians away. But both human beings and angels, both good and bad, whether they realize the truth and the beauty of Jesus Christ or not, they will all one day submit to the understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
We actually see this in Philippians 2, verse 9 to 11, which says, Therefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that the name, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those in earth, and of those under, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Notice in here that it doesn't say that everybody will be excited about that. Do you understand that? That there will be those that through gritted teeth they will be made to bow, to bend the knee, and to recognize and submit to the understanding that Jesus Christ is Lord. They're not going to like it, but they will. And then the other part is those who will actually be reconciled back to Christ. Those who see the truth in Christ, those who see the beauty of who he is, those who submit their life willingly to them, they accept the free gift of grace through the death of Jesus Christ, they will be reconciled back to God. They are reconciled back to God if they are born again. That they have undergone this process of reconciliation by which their relationship with God has changed. We will get to that here in a moment. Whether friend or foe, one day everyone will recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now in verse 20, we see that it says that reconciliation is made by, ha or having, having been made by peace, by the blood of his cross. In verse 20 and verse 22, you see what's called parallel clauses. They're connected as they both point to the peace that is spoken about in verse 20. 20. Now what was the means by which this peace was achieved? Well, in verse 20, we see that it was the blood of his cross. I'm not going to lie to you, when I thought about preaching the communion sermon last week, I was greatly tempted to try and add this into it as well, because it speaks so clearly of what we celebrate at communion. And as I actually took a look at doing that, I just became completely overwhelmed by the amount of material about Jesus Christ. And I thought, my goodness, I have to break this up or I'm going to preach for four and a half hours. <laughs> the means by which peace was achieved was the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is extremely important. This is what we celebrate at communion. In Leviticus 17.11, when we consider the Old Covenant, when we consider the sacrificial system that God put in place to atone for the sins of his people, it speaks to the importance and the necessity of blood being spilled on the cross. Leviticus 17.11 says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes aton atonement. For the soul. Do you see the importance of the fact that Christ had to spill his blood on the cross? That the life of Christ was tied up that the, in the blood that ran through his veins, and because of the blood that was shed on the cross, there is remission of sins. Now, in verse 21 and 22, we see a great example or a great case study of how this plays out. Verse 20 speaks to all those in heaven and on earth being reconciled to God. And in verse 21 and 22, we see that this is actually in a great, ref a great reference to human beings. And so let's consider this. Most of us in here, or I would say a lot of us in here this morning, are born again believers. And we rejoice in that. But as I go through this over the next moments, just because you are a born-again believer of Jesus Christ, please do not tune out. Please do not switch off. That this is just as much for you as it is for somebody that has no idea who Jesus Christ is. And if the latter is you this morning, and you have no idea who Jesus Christ is, please listen very carefully, because the state of your soul rests on who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. So let's ask this question. What is the state of a person before they come to Christ? What is the state of a person before they come to Christ? Well, verse 21 answers this very clearly. It says this. 
And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. That doesn't leave that much for the imagination. That a person or the state of a person, the state of their soul before they come to God is that they are totally opposed to the things of God. Verse 21 again shows that they are alienated, that they are enemies in the mind by wicked works. That they're living in active rebellion against God. You read this this morning as Pastor Tom worked through with you the scripture reading. In Romans 5, 8, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now get this. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it does not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you understand that? That those who are in the flesh, those who have not submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, those who are not born again are in the flesh, their minds are set on the flesh, and they cannot please God. They are living in hostility to Him. This doesn't matter who you are. That all human beings are born on a level playing field when it comes to the things of salvation. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much education you have. It doesn't matter how externally good or bad you look as a human being. None of that matters. All that matters is the state of your soul before God. And the Bible is extremely clear that if you have not submitted to Jesus Christ, if you're not born again, then you are carnally minded. You're you're living in hostility. You're living in rebellion against the Lord. When we come to the Bible, we see that God's standard is perfection. God's standard is perfection. We must know this. We must understand this. The Bible speaks clearly in the Old Testament of the Ten Commandments. Thou shall. Right? We see all of the things that God expects of his people. And it doesn't take you long to move through that list of the Ten Commandments before you realize that, my goodness, I cannot actually keep these perfectly that I try, I might have a good hour, I might have a good 10 minutes, but sooner or later I am going to sin. I am going to transgress what God's law says. If you want to move past the Ten Commandments in the law as the Jews had to keep it, there were 613 total commands. Good luck with that. That's a difficult thing to do, to keep all of the commands of the law. But when we move to the New Testament we see that Jesus actually has a lot to say about God's standard. That God expects you to keep that standard perfectly, but what he does is he takes the Ten Commandments, he takes the 613 commandments of the law, and he completely and utterly raises the bar. Jesus says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. That you're to love your neighbor as yourself. That these are the two greatest commandments and that really all of the law can be summarized in just those two points. And so consider this morning how you are doing with loving the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Consider how you're doing with loving your neighbor as yourself. We move to the Sermon on the Mount, and in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus again raises the bar even further. Jesus says, if you have lusted after somebody in your heart, that that is on par and equals committing adultery. Jesus then moves on and says that if you hate your brother, that that is on par and that is equal to murder. You see, the truth of the matter is that mankind's problem is deeper than we can ever begin to imagine. That the problem with mankind, the problem with man, is at the very base and at the very nature of who we are. That our hostility towards God, our rebellion against Him, is not the result of some sort of external conditioning. 
right? It's not some sort of defect in our upbringing, right? That's not what the Bible teaches at all. We live in a culture today where everybody seems to play the victim. Well, I'm like this because of this and this and this and this and this and this. And then we just rinse and repeat those excuses again and again and again. That the reason that I am the way that I am is not because of me, but it's because of a host of other excuses that have all been done to me, that have all happened to me. Now, I do not in any way, shape, or form want to minimize this morning some of the pain, some of the suffering, some of the absolute tragedy that you have been through. But the reality of the matter and what the Bible clearly teaches is that what has been done to you or the circumstances in your life, however tragic they may be, has actually nothing to do with the fact that at the very base nature of who you are, you are broken. That we are all broken. That's an incredibly important thing to remember. And for the Christian especially, that we come on church on Sunday morning, we put on our nice coat, we put on our tie, we get in the car, we get out of the car, we have smiles on our faces... Statistically, we may have actually had an argument with our spouse or our kids on the way to the car, but we get out of the car, we're just all smiles that everything's wonderful. But what we need to remember is that we are all broken people. That there is something wrong with us that we cannot have any sort of handle in fixing or rectifying. We cannot do anything to reconcile this. Our very being is affected. We are sick at the very core of who we are. This is by far and away man's greatest problem. It's a fascinating thing today to consider walking around this world in Chatham and going outside and just asking, what is the greatest problem in the world today? What is the greatest problem in the world today? The the answers that you would get would be fascinating, right? You would have liberals say that it's conservatives. You would have conservatives say that it's liberals, Democrats, Republicans, whatever it may be. Right? But the reality of the matter, as Christians, we should fundamentally understand and never waver from the fact that the problem with the world is actually me. That I am the problem with the world. That there is something in me that is broken that cannot be reconciled. And so man is in this massive predicament. We said at the beginning that God is perfect, that he sets a standard that is perfection. Well, why is that the case? It's the, it, the reason for this is that God cannot associate with sin. You say, God is a God of love. Yes, that's true. That is absolutely true, and we rejoice in that, and that is a beautiful thing, that God loves us, that God has a desire to be with us, that he loves us so much that he sent Christ for us. But God is also a God, as the Bible reveals, of holiness, of righteousness, and of justice. And God cannot be anything less than he is. And therefore, God cannot in any way associate with sin. One of the clearest examples of this, I think, in all of the Bible, it's a a story that, that, to be honest with you, I wrestled with for a really, really long time. It's found in 2 Samuel, and it's the the story of, or the the real event of, of Uzzah, as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back in to the city, it's a wonderful and it's a joyous time, and Uzzah is tasked with actually carrying the cart. Ark of the Covenant on there, God dwells there, and, and so obviously this is a really big deal. Well, there's, in the story it tells us that the oxen stumbles, and that the cart is actually about to fall, therefore the Ark of the Covenant is about to fall into the muck and the mire, And Uzzah just reaches out his hand, and and as you read it in the text, it's almost just, he didn't have time to think that it was just an instinct, that he just reached to grab it, and he comes in contact with the Ark of the Covenant, he comes in contact with the, the holy and the righteous presence of God, and instantly he is executed. He is, he's dead. And for a long time I wrestled with that, well, if God is a God of love, then how does this story make sense? But let's link this back to the beginning. What I really did not understand was the fullness of who God is. That God cannot be anything less than he is. And God is a God of love, yes, but God is also a God of perfect holiness, of righteousness, and of justice. And any time this God of holiness and righteousness and justice comes into contact with sin, those two things do not go together. And the result is catastrophic. And so let's bring it back this morning. 
God is a God of love, but he's also a God of righteousness and holiness and justice, and therefore he cannot associate with sin. And so the broken nature that every man, woman, and child has in them is a massive, massive problem because it separates us completely from a holy God. Now, what is the remedy for this? Is there a remedy for this? Well, if you and I are transformed, blood-bought men and women who believe in Jesus Christ, we know the beautiful truth of what this remedy is, that it's the God-man Jesus Christ. That the fullness of God dwells in Jesus and that God saw fit to send Jesus to walk in a human body, to live the life that nobody else could live, to suffer as human beings suffer, to suffer unimaginably on the cross, and to die, a, to die a death that he did not deserve to die. And the reason that he had to do this was to be a substitute for the death that we could never live. You see, a sinful man, a sinful woman, a sinful child cannot do anything to reconcile themselves back to God. The only being that could ever do that was one that was God himself, one that was perfect. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to die. He came to live the life we could not live. He came to be the sacrifice that we could not be. And he went through with it on the cross of Calvary. That's what we celebrated last week in, com in communion. The means by this was the body that he was broken and the blood that he shed. Christ drank the wrath, Christ drank the cup of God's wrath in full. That when he climbed the cross, when his side was pierced, when he finally gave up the ghost, when he finally at last yelled, it is finished, that it was completely and utterly finished. You see, this is the great news of the Christian faith. That there is a way, there is a means to be reconciled back to God. It's possible to be at peace with God. It's possible to be in a relationship with God. That despite our sinful nature, despite our brokenness, Despite that we are very much like Uzzah in 2 Samuel, that Jesus Christ has made a way that we can come in contact with that holy and righteous God that expects perfection. Do you not see that? Isn't that a beautiful thing? That God's standard has not changed, that he expects perfection, but that if you are a born-again Christian, he looks down at you and he doesn't see the muck and the mire and the disaster that you have made of your life. He sees the perfection of Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb. That's a beautiful truth. It's a truth that we must never, ever, ever stop meditating upon. And so if you are here this morning, if you're here this morning and you do not know Christ, if you have not experienced the grace, the peace, the, the understanding that you are now reconciled back to a holy and righteous God, well, the Bible speaks very clearly that if you have a desire to know Christ, that Christ has died for you and that you are to repent. You're to repent. You're to understand that there's nothing that you can do to make that relationship with God a reality but you are to understand that you are to repent, to say, God, I know that I cannot live up to your standard. I know that I need a substitute, and I believe that that substitute is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That if you repent and you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will be saved. Understand this, that the cross is evidence that there is no length to which God will not go to reconcile lost sinners to himself. He did that for you. He did that for me. I don't know the sinfulness of your heart. I know the sinfulness of my own heart. I know the brokenness of my own heart. And I understand that God, in all of his greatness, in all of his wonder, in all of his majesty, did that for me, that he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross so that I could have a way to be reconciled back to him. That is a beautiful truth, and that is a beautiful truth to completely and utterly give our life for. Now in verse 23, I just want to read it again one more time. We're going to look at verse 23 as we come to a close this morning. 
Verse 23 says, if indeed you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which Paul, I, Paul, became a minister. Now, anytime you come to the Bible, anytime you read, and anytime you, you see something that makes you just stop and kind of pause and maybe do a little bit of a double take, pay attention to that. Underline it. Circle it. Write down as many questions that come to your mind because this should be a passage. This should be a verse where that actually takes place. In verse 20 to 22, we see the beautiful truth that we have just walked through that God has made a way through Jesus Christ in which sinful men and women, boys and girls, can be reconciled back to a holy God through His Son, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And yet in verse 23, it's a conditional statement. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. Well, if I'm reading that at face value, I'm really excited from verse 20 to 22 that this truth is a reality, that this is possible for men and women, boys and girls. And yet I get to verse 23 and I say, okay, well, but wait a minute. If indeed I continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and am not moved away from the hope of the gospel... Does that in any way sow some sort of doubt? Does that in any way speak to the fact that maybe this salvation that has been wrought by such a horrific death of Jesus Christ on the cross, that that is in some way in in jeopardy? In verse 23, if just reading it at a face value, that maybe that would be what it suggests. But I want to explain to you this morning that this is in no way, shape, or form what this verse is speaking to. Again, we interpret Scripture with Scripture, and Scripture is clear that if you have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, that there is nothing that can be done that can separate you from the fact that you are now a blood-bought child of the King. That's a beautiful thing, and we could point to a number of passages in Scripture this morning. I would encourage you to be Bereans, to go home from here, and to search those Scriptures out, and to see the beauty of the doctrine of eternal security. That if you are saved by Christ, you are always saved by Christ. We don't have time to get there this morning in this particular sermon. But in verse 23, it is not in any way teaching that there is any sort of doubt in your salvation. What it is teaching is that if you have been saved by the blood of Christ, that that is something that you would never in any way, shape, or form walk away from. That if you are a, authentically a Christian, that if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that if you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, there is nowhere else that you will ever want to go. That you will continue to be grounded and steadfast in your faith. In Ezekiel 36 verse 27, in, uh, sorry, Ezekiel 36 verse 26, God says, that I will, give, I will take out your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then he follows up with this in verse 27 by saying, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will keep my judgments and do them. You see, there's no hint here of the fact that you can be saved by the blood of Christ and then maybe at some point decide that you don't want to walk in his ways anymore. That in fact, if somebody claims to be a Christian, and then down the road they, do no, or they no longer walk in his ways, they go their own way, they see maybe the, the lust of the world, and they want to move in that direction, that it's a very sad reality that they were never actually a Christian truly in the first place. That on that day, many will call, or many will, pro- many will, will claim the name of Jesus Christ. And he will look at them and say, I'm sorry, I, I never knew you. That is a fearful and that is a terrifying thing. But that is not what this verse is talking about. If we are giving Christ our, the, the preeminent spot in our life that he deserves, then we will remain firmly grounded and steadfast in the faith. A little later in the the book of Colossians, in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, 
So walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. That if you are a blood-bought, saved man, man, woman, boy or girl, that if Christ has saved you, you will remain steadfast, you will remain deeply rooted in Jesus Christ. And so for the Christian this morning, well, what does this look like? What does this look like? And we're going to use this as a, a great point of application, and then from there we will close. What does this look like? Well, this looks like abiding in Christ. That if you understand the truth of what we have walked through this morning, and we rejoice in the fact that you have, if this is the case, then what are you to do? You are to abide in Christ. How do you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith? You abide in Christ. You stay with Christ. Once you have tasted a relationship with Jesus Christ, the reality is is that you will never have a desire to go anywhere else. And so what do you do? Well, you walk daily with him. How do you walk daily with him? You read your Bible. You pray. You surround yourself with believers in Christ. You serve the body of Christ. You go out from here and you share the gospel. You say, well, Pastor Andrew, that's just a list of do's and do's and do's and do's. Is this what the Christian faith actually looks like? That I am saved by Christ and then I have to just have all of these boxes, all of these things that I need to do. Well, today I need to read my Bible. So I read my three chapters. I close my Bible. Check. Okay, I'm good for that. Today I need to pray. Lord, I thank you for the day that you've given me. Amen. I check. I pray. That is not what's in view here. That is not what is in view here. And what I want to do just rather briefly is just connect this idea, again, of a big view of God to this daily walking and abiding with Him. I said earlier in the sermon that a massive view of who God is, a ever-growing view of who God is, has massive implications for your life. And this is where it comes to play. Because the reality is, is if your view of God is huge, if your view of God is ever-increasing, if your understanding of Jesus Christ and your desire to want to know Him is ever-increasing, that as, like Lucy with Aslan, Jesus Christ gets larger and larger and larger in your life, that abiding with Him, reading your Bible, praying, surrounding yourself with Christian people, serving the body of Christ, sharing the gospel, it will not be something that you do to just check the boxes but that it would be the greatest desire of your life to continue to be grounded and steadfast in the faith and to abide with Him. Christian man today, Christian woman, God has not set this up so that we become His slaves and that we are just subject to do all of these things, that God loves us so much that He sent Jesus to die for us. And that when we see the truth of that, we submit to the Lordship of Christ, when we become a Christian, the greatest joy that we can ever experience in this life and for the rest of eternity is abiding in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Of doing the things that he has called us to do, not legalistically, but in a spirit of worship, because that is our greatest desire in order to do those things. And so who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else could whisper and darkness would tremble? We understand the answer to that is the Lord Jesus Christ. All the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. That God in all of his majesty, all of his wonder, all of his just completely uncomprehensible attributes, in all of that, he loved you so much that he chose to make a way in which you could be reconciled back to him. If you have not been reconciled back to him, if you do not know who Christ is, he wants you desperately. He longs to know you. And that you can know him through the fullness of God who dwells in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for what it describes or how it describes who you are. 
And we thank you for how it describes Jesus Christ. That all of the awesome majesty and wonder that is God the Father is wrapped up in fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, may our view, may our understanding of who God is be ever-growing. And we thank you that as we go to your word and as our understanding grows, that we can never come to the end. We can never reach the limit of the beauty, the majesty, and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we go this week and be Bereans. May we have a desire to abide with you. That it is our greatest desire, if we truly know who you are, to abide. And that we would dive deeper and deeper into your word. That we would spend time with you. And that we would give you the preeminent place that you deserve. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With the glorious truth of reconciliation in view, we are going to close our service this morning with an appropriate song. Before the throne of God above. So please stand and sing. The greatest prayer that we have for you today is that you can sing that last verse honestly. That you know that your life is hidden with Christ, that your sins are forgiven by him. If you don't know that, I encourage you to talk to somebody about it. Thank you for the great sermon this morning, Pastor Andrew. Um, before you leave, just so you know, there is coffee, and so we invite you to stay and fellowship with us. Uh, t- next Sunday is Father's Day, and that means next Sunday is the day that you need to bring the baby bottles for refuge back. So if you haven't done that yet, then please do. And if you're waiting until the last week to pick one up, you can still do that today and bring it back next week, okay? Thank you so much for being here today. God bless you. See you later.